Um, welcome to our fifth computational science seminar from the Joint Task Force Initiative. This is an um, initiative uh, between University of Chicago, Argonne National Lab, and Fermilab. And basically, it's a way for the computing organizations at the different, these at our three close locally institutions to share resources and, and, uh, and do things together in terms of computing because uh, the you know, more things we can do together, the better, and leverage our, uh, our strengths. Um, and so this is a, uh, our fifth computational science seminar. To the next slide. Oops. This is not working. There we go. So we've already had um, several uh, science seminars. I hope you've been able to attend these. Uh, we've had three um, in, uh, in 2019 and in January 2020 about AI from Jan Tron, Rebecca Willett, and Ian Foster. And you can sort of see a theme that we try to get a person from each of the, the three institutions. Uh, and then after uh, Ian's talk, we took a break. Um, and then as I'm sure you are all well aware, we took a longer break uh, trying to, to negotiate and navigate the COVID-19 situation. And I hope all of you are doing well. But uh, last month, we started again with Salma Habib. Um, and then today, we are very pleased to have Nick Beamster from Uni University of Chicago, who will talk to us about uh, why and how networks should run themselves. And then next month, a uh, date will be sent out uh, soon. Uh, Daniel Elvira from Fermilab will, will talk about simulations and particle physics, and the title will be determined soon. OK, so Jonathan, do you want to um, introduce our speaker today? Yeah. I will stop sharing. So uh, today's spe uh, speaker, Nick Feenster, he comes to us by way of the University of Chicago, where he is a Neubauer professor of computer science, and he's the director of the Center for Data and Computing. Uh, so Nick uh, received his PhD in computer science from uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2000 and 2001. He, uh, he earned his electrical engineering degree from MIT. Uh, so he's worked for a number of companies before uh, his venture into academia, uh, and he's uh, spent most of his career working with and exploring new paradigms and com in computer networking and network systems. Uh, so he has brought this expertise to the university and the Chicagoland area, and he's partnered with uh, uh, other entities here in Chicagoland and is hopefully uh, going to be working with the, the, uh, both labs in, in some respect. So I will hand off uh, uh, the, uh, to Nick so that he can deliver his, his talk on uh, how and why and how networks should wow. run themselves. It looks like a perfect example. Actually, Nick, while your slides are coming up, I'll just tell people that um, everyone's going to st will stay muted. So if you have a question that we'll go through, go through at the end, you can put it in the chat. If you have an immediate question, you can raise your hand. Uh, and if it's a good point to, uh, for, you to, for us to interrupt, then we'll let you unmute yourself. But otherwise, please put your questions in the chat. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about applications of machine learning through computer networks. Um, what we've been working on in that topic area over the past um, 10 years or so. Um, actually maybe going on 15 now, uh, and then what's, uh, how recent developments in networking and um, network technology have made it possible to um, enable more, even more exciting uh, and real-time applications of machine learning to networking, uh, to various problems in networking. So I'm going to talk uh, primarily about th three different types of network management tasks that ne uh, people who run networks perform. And I'll talk about uh, both kind of the way it was um, in pre-machine learning and AI, and then I'll talk about sort of trends. Uh, and I'll talk about also our contributions in those areas uh, as, as we sort of uh, ride those te technical trends to develop new tools and techniques to apply uh, machine learning and AI to uh, to networks. So 
So the three areas, as I mentioned, are configuration, uh, network security, uh, including anomaly detection and performance diagnosis. And I said these, uh, um, uh, these tasks are becoming increasingly amenable to machine learning as, as the tasks themselves mature and as machine learning capabilities um, uh, also become more mature. Um, when we think about um, uh, you know, what it takes to, uh, to run uh, and manage a network, um, there's essentially three, there's, I'd like to think of it as a control loop. Uh, there's uh, essentially measurement or extracting data from the network. Uh, there is modeling, which sort of enables us to uh, um, ask higher level inference questions about what may be going on in the network with respect to performance or security. And then there's uh, ultimately actions that one might want to take as far as control are concerned. Um, Now, applying machine learning to networks is actually a pretty old idea. Um, we've, been, we've been doing that ourselves uh, for quite some time. So let me kind of paint a picture for that, and then we'll ask naturally what's new. Why are we talking about this today? Uh, so uh, one area where we've, we've done a lot of application of this is in security. Um, you know, dating back, and I think uh, application of machine learning to network security really um, date back even before our work uh, in applying things like naive Bayes um, uh, detection algorithms to the content of email. And where I think where we entered the fray, uh, we started uh, applying machine learning to network traffic, uh, in particular looking at traffic patterns, um, keying off the fact that spammers and attackers exhibit different kinds of network um, traffic patterns um, uh, than regular email senders. And that's essentially uh, become the theme of my work over the last um, 10 years or so is how do you basically take raw network signal or raw signal out of the network in the form of traffic and then convert that into sort of meaning, uh, meaningful representations or representations that machine learning algorithms can derive uh, meaning from to, to help operators improve the performance of communication networks. Um, Okay, well, I mentioned that control loop and there are a lot of technology trends that actually make it possible to, uh, to, to think about really starting to close that loop. And I don't think this list here is by means exhaustive. This is kind of uh, uh, essentially the top two things that that's, uh, whack you over the head uh, as, as, as things that are going on in this area. One is the advent of high speed programmable networks. Um, many people may have heard the buzzword term, um, software-defined networking, okay? And uh, essentially what that is, is using high-level software programs to control the behavior of networks, essentially how uh, networks uh, forward packets, how they make decisions about how to treat traffic. Um, and then increasingly, you know, that, that's, that's been a trend for at least 10 years, um, actually probably even longer than that, maybe 15 years. Um, but increasingly now, uh, you know, these, these, the notion of programmability is moving beyond control. The idea basically that you can uh, use or exploit the programmability of networks to get better information out of the network. So you can ask, ask uh, more intelligent or more uh, actionable questions about performance or security. That's becoming increasingly possible because uh, now with increased programmability, you don't have to basically just keep be stuck with the data that a router or a switch gives you. You can actually write programs uh, to uh, uh, um, to to essentially get the data that you need to train uh, the models. The second, I'd say, I would say, significant trend is the uh, sort of proliferation or the the rapid development of uh, let's just call it a data science pipeline. Um, uh, open source data analytics tools, uh, ranging from Spark and others, um, that, that help manage the uh, data analysis workflow, uh, to open source machine learning libraries and toolkits like Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow, make it possible to really pull these kind of techniques off the shelf and apply them. But that actually leaves one uh, hugely significant problem 
which is how you represent the data as input uh, to, to basically train and apply these models. And that's sort of become uh, the focus of my work over the past uh, year or two. And I'll, I'll close the talk talking about some of the, you know, some of the ways that we're looking to, that we're working on closing that gap between uh, network data and representation and the models that we, that we have to train with those. Okay, great. So, uh, right, so here's that loop and the, and the trends, right, that sort of point to the possibility that, you know, <laughs> referring to the title, how might a network run itself? And there's sort of a weak analogy to self-driving cars there. Um, I think it's a weak analogy. Um, obviously, a lot of the problems are very different. But the idea, of, um, and of course, this, this is not a new idea either. It's kind of dates back to buzzwords like autonomic networking, right? But the idea basically that network, um, control systems could get precisely the data that they need from the network to train the models that ultimately drive actions. Um, this is not necessarily to say that a human is completely removed from this loop, but a lot of things that require um, uh, either um, uh, synthesis or, or complex reasoning with the models or um, uh, coordinated action could be uh, at least partially automated. Okay, so now let me kind of jump into management, or con I should call this configuration uh, uh, questions. Then I'll talk a, a little bit about security, and then finally I'll talk about performance. And then I'm going to close with some discussion of the challenges of data representation in these areas. Okay, so, um, right. So this actually, this slide I think dates back to um, uh, my, my PhD dissertation back in um, uh, to, you know, this is like 2005, <laughs> I think when I made this slide and, um, we've come a fair way since this point, but essentially the motivation is, is it remains similar. Okay. The idea being that like a network operator, as they, as they make changes to, uh, their network, as they deploy new equipment, routers, switches, firewalls, middle boxes, load balancers, and so forth. Um, they need to configure them, they need to drop them in, and importantly, they need to know what's gonna happen before they make a change, right? So there's, a, there's an element of prediction uh, and troubleshooting there. Okay, so um, there are a couple of issues there. One is that if you make a mistake, there's downtime, but the other, the other issue is that sometimes that you make changes or introduce changes and the problems may not be immediately apparent until some other uh, you know, component experiences a failure and exposes a, a mistake that was introduced at some earlier point. So then tracking these things down can be a little bit challenging. Um, there's a long body of work that, that I've done in that area. A lot of it does not involve uh, machine learning. In fact, a um, fair bit of it involves things like static configuration analysis and modeling. Um, but let me sort of talk about um, what, so that I started working on that, I think in the um, early 2000s and then um, this, you know, we, we built these static configuration analysis checkers in 2005. And then come around 2008, um, a student and I um, worked on, um, I guess, sort of what you might think of as a conceptual extension to this, which is like, could, could machine learning basically apply to, to these types of configuration problems so that you could basically predict? And here's kind of the nature of, of, of where, machine, where and why machine learning uh, might uh, makes sense here is that these kinds of problems um, uh, require essentially what I would call closed loop analysis. Um, you have to basically completely model the protocols, um, develop closed form analytic solutions to what's, you know, what's going on and so forth. And as systems get in increasingly complex, that actually becomes, um, uh, I don't want to say insurmountable, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very daunting challenge. And so um, a student and I basically said, well, what if you could, you could basic, what if you had a bunch of data uh, already in your network? Um, could you build models uh, using that data to sort of model performance to help you ask predict predictive kind of questions, which is really what machine learning uh, is, is all about and really good at. Okay. So um, here's an example scenario of network configuration that we explored. The idea being that you have um, web clients, okay? So like your web browser, and it's gonna basically um, 
contact the website. And if, if you know something about web, web architecture, then this, then this diagram looks very familiar. Um, if you don't, um, basically the thing to know here is that most websites are not served off of a single server, uh, but rather your browser contacts what's called a front end or an FE, which serves you a lot of static content. That might be logos, graphics, et cetera. Um, and then if you're doing something like a web search, right, or anything that requires dynamic uh, loading of content, that front end basically goes off and pulls that dynamic content from a back end. Um, and that might be a database or something else that requires computation or, or what have you. Basically assembles that content, uh, packages it with the front end, uh, you know, static content, including say JavaScript and style sheets and so forth, and then serves that to the user. And um, one thing that um, large content delivery networks like to do is make sure that they're sending you to uh, a good front end because what they can do is essentially optimize your experience um, by starting to serve you some of the static content. So essentially your eyes play tricks on you as the page starts to load while the dynamic stuff is being assembled uh, in, you know, in, in the background. So you might want to, you might want to make changes to see, you know, or, or deploy improvements to see basically the effects of, of what, um, uh, 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 what changing a front end or a back end might do to the performance of your overall system, let's say a web search performance. Um, but for these dynamic systems, it's tough to accurately model response time and it's also very difficult to uh, specify or evaluate these scenarios. Okay, so one example, right, is um, you might want to take down a data center for maintenance. Okay, this is actually um, a large content delivery network. Uh, where uh, some uh, operator wanted to bring down a front end in India and reroute some of those customers to a front end in Taiwan. And uh, essentially what uh, they wanted to know was how's that going to affect response time? Like what is the user going to see as far as page loads, uh, loading of dynamic content and so forth. Um, so this basically is a machine learning problem. Uh, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, you could perhaps express this in, you know, in, in terms of uh, analytics or equations or simulations. And that was probably what people would have done uh, maybe 25 years ago. Uh, but essentially what we did in this work was recognize that with enough data, you could essentially model response time as a function. Okay. And basically learn the relationship between various input features in your network and a higher order uh, quality of experience, such as the response time to some service. Okay. Uh, and this system basically allowed uh, the operators to input uh, various variables like the location of a front end um, uh, into in as inputs. And the system would then subsequently use those inputs to uh, determine their effects on uh, various network layer of properties. Uh, including things like latency, round trip time, uh, um, and so forth. Um, and then using those derivative features, um, use a regression, uh, basically a regression um, estimation to predict the, res the ultimate response time of the system. Okay, so I'll skip the, um, you know, I'll skip over this pretty quickly. The system is called what WISE, uh, what if scenario evaluator. And the idea basically is that you want to make it as easy as possible for an operator to ask a question, like a what if question. What if I basically changed for a group of users uh, in an access network, what if I changed the location of the front end? Um, obviously that kind of specification is going to have a ton of effect on underlying network features, um, latency, packet loss rates, perhaps even content because uh, you've got maybe different content hosted at different replicas or different versions. So the way that that was, the way that we basically handled that was uh, uh, using basically causality, right? To say that essentially if a certain variable like geography has a particular value, that is going to have some effect on a, su uh, a subset of the features that are ultimately input to the regression. Okay, so we use local causal discovery to do that. And then once we had a causal dependency graph, we could basically say, 
when we modify a particular feature, how is that going to affect other features in our model? And then, of course, once we have the, the resulting effects on those input features, uh, we could basically use, uh, you know, we could train a response time estimation function to figure out essentially what the service response time would be. Um, that worked pretty well. Um, that system was ultimately deployed at Google uh, as a way for uh, their operators to predict uh, how various changes in their uh, configuration for, uh, for web search uh, would ultimately affect search response time. Okay, so that's, that's the performance story. Um, here's security. Okay, so um, uh, essentially, uh, I, 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 I gave you a little bit of a taste of this earlier uh, at the beginning. This is definitely not a new problem. I think the application of machine learning to security, uh, as I mentioned, it goes back to spam filtering. So, you know, almost, almost to the beginning of network security itself. Um, we looked at spam. Right, and our, our particular view on this was, um, there's a couple conventional approaches. One is you could look at content. That was the classical approach, was let's look at words uh, in, 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 in a message that's being sent. And the problem with that, that um, operators were experiencing at the time, and this was about 2000, um, 2006, 2007, um, was that operator, uh, sorry, was that spammers would uh, essentially, um, <laughs> shall I say, uh, uh, morph their, their messages into formats that filters, content filters had a tough time parsing. And right? so um, if, you, if your mail was coming in text, then it might be easy to tokenize that text and throw it into a naive Bayes classifier. If the thing comes as a, you know, probably people <laughs> may be old enough in this group to remember some of these. Uh, but if it comes as some weird dithered image, that starts to become tough. Uh, if it comes as an Excel sheet or a PDF or an MP3, then you suddenly have to apply more computation on the defense side uh, to even get the filter, to give the filter any hope of working. Because you basically got to get from this weird looking input to, to, to something that you can train a model on. Um, the other sort of prevailing approach at the time was to basically figure out the IP address of the sender. Uh, and then use that as an indicator that perhaps this mail server, um, you know, would not um, would not operate as expected. Uh, or sorry, would would would, uh, would send uh, more spam than than legitimate mail. I should say. Now the problem with that is that um, well, now of course this probably wouldn't work at all given like the the sort of rise of cloud based email and and things of that nature. Um, but, um, of course, using an IP address uh, to blacklist the sender uh, turns out to be a huge problem because the IP addresses the senders are always changing as well. Um, lots of, so lots, lots of challenges there. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the details here, but like uh, essentially um, we did about, I would say, 10 years of work in this problem, applying machine learning to network traffic and various aspects of network infrastructure to essentially catch um, message-based, unwanted message-based attacks uh, before they get even, before they even get launched. So here's kind of the basic intuition is that someone spent sending a spam message probably has some objective. Right? They want to sell you something or they want to steal your password or something. Okay. But in order to do any of those things, like convert on the attack, uh, they have to maybe get a web server. Like if they're selling you uh, pharmaceuticals, they need to set up a website. And in order to basically set up their website, they also need to get some resources like registered domain names and, and so on and so forth. And the idea uh, behind some of, you know, some of our work that's, uh, you know, culminated uh, a long arc of, you know, basically 10 years of work in this area was to basically see, could we basically detect attacks before they even happen? Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, there's various uh, techniques that we use to do that. Uh, one was, I mean, we started by looking at sending behavior, but as, as, I, as I sort of hinted at on that earlier slide, uh, eventually, we, we traced activities all the way to the, the registra DNS domain name registration of, of bad domains. Um, 
let me give you like one example of something where, uh, you know, before cutting to the DNS story, um, another example of something where uh, looking at infrastructure signals uh, can provide some predictive power. Um, so uh, you might think, what does internet routing have to do with, with attacks? Um, at attacks are uh, typically data oriented and routing is just like setting up paths. Um, well, if you think about the sort of analogy of a getaway car in a bank robbery or something, then uh, maybe that would give you some, some, uh, some ideas. Um, so what we started to observe by looking at internet routing data was um, networks that would pop up on the network for a very short period of time, launch attacks, and then disappear. Okay, and it turns out, um, oops, that didn't show up right. So it turns out that a lot of these, these uh, these networks that show up for a short period of time are actually pretty big chunks of the network. And there's, uh, if you know anything about internet routing, then uh, you might be able to sort of understand why sort of briefly stealing 1 256 of all IP uh, v4 addresses might work. <laughs> I won't get into it in this brief talk, but it's kind of um, an interesting sidebar. Um, the thing is, that, you know, uh, I'm sorry. Um, in looking at things like uh, routing infrastructure, you know, these kinds of um, uh, telltale behaviors become features to, to predict attacks. Because if you can see in the data that a network has just popped up out of nowhere, then you might be able to predict that something bad is going to happen from that part of the network. Um, another thing that we saw is this one is less predictive, but, you know, certainly um, uh, follows some intuition is that spammers actually send uh, messages from a lot of locations in the network that are very close, right? So you basically get this clustering of a constellation, if you will, uh, of a lot of email centers close together on the network, which is kind of unusual because typically an organization might have one or very few handful of uh, mail servers responsible for sending uh, messages. It's unlikely that is that you that uh, an organization is going to have a ton of uh, you know hundreds of mail servers. So that was that's kind of another telltale sign. We use random forest classifier in, in the case of the of the sending behaviors and other network behaviors to uh, to do a pretty good job getting uh, and detecting these kind of spam uh, messages uh, as they were being sent. Um, as you can see there, we basically did as well as, uh, as the IP blacklist at the time, but we didn't have to manually train anything and we could keep up as, as behaviors were changing. Um, our next, uh, you know, our next, our next uh, win there was to basically turn reactive detection into predictive, uh, uh, you know, predictive um, analytics for security. And as I mentioned, kind of going back, if you could sort of go from the attack and work back in time, recognizing that attackers use URLs and websites to propagate uh, scams, malware, et cetera. Okay, you could look for other kinds of things. Like you could look for a bunch of people querying a new domain uh, at, a, you know, at, a, at a particular time. Or you, if, you had, if you knew anything about registrations, you could track when a particular domain name was registered uh, and then how that gets used in the, in the, in the early part of the life cycle. So we looked at both when domains get registered as well as like how people are looking them up to, to essentially figure out, uh, you know, exactly what, um, uh, you know, um, whether we could figure out whether something was different about attackers than, than legitimate uh, players. Turns out actually, yes. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, domains that were used in attacks appeared uh, almost right away in the spam campaign right after registration, right? So uh, how are you gonna use that in machine learning? Well, you can imagine a feature, right? Basically looks at like, well, how, how old is this domain name, right? Since I, if I see a burst of messages uh, for a very new domain name, that might be a clue uh, as to what's going on. Um, and also queries to these domains increase really, really quickly, right? So again, if you imagine a domain registration, domain gets registered, unlikely to become very popular very quickly uh, but if an attacker is using it uh, as part of a campaign of some kind 
and sending lots and lots of emails to people with that domain name, then you start to see clicks very fast on something that was like basically registered yesterday. And that is, again, a telltale sign of, of attacks. Um, you can go back further um, uh, with the data on the registration. <coughs> so you can look at properties of how a domain gets registered to predict that an attack is going to happen before it even gets included in a message. Okay, so here we basically use, you know, predictive analytics. So the idea, right, is that, okay, if you have to wait till the message is sent before you detect it, right, well, let's see if we can work our way backwards to registration. Um, so it turns out that when attackers register domain names, um, you know, they, they have to basically look, uh, you know, like something that you might actually want to visit, canadianpharmacy.com or, uh, you know, what have you. It's, it can't just be garbage letters and numbers. And so what this means is that we can use uh, that property that, that um, attackers like to be true of scam domains uh, at registration time to detect what may be going on. So there's a bunch of features that turn out to be very useful here. As, as is the case in many data science and machine learning problems, a lot of the effort here is in feature engineering based on domain knowledge. Um, but things like the registrar, where it was registered, which name servers are being used to serve, uh, serve those queries, uh, various trigrams and the characters, et cetera, are helpful. Turns out there's some other things that are helpful, <coughs> like has it been registered before? Okay, so one of the things that we discovered was, uh, and, and I think we basically invented these, um, these concepts, is there's a notion of basically a drop catch in, uh, in domain registration where there's, if, if you buy a domain, it has no reputation, then someone's never seen it before, that might be a red flag if it becomes wildly popular. So actually, if you're going to basically use a domain in an attack, uh, it's better to use one that has a gold star reputation. Um, so essentially what attackers would do is sort of wait for a gold star domain to expire, to expire, and then they'd quickly suck that one up, right? And then they'd use that. Good, there's a domain with a good reputation. Um, but that little drop catch, right, is a feature. If we can observe that someone quickly picks up a domain after it has expired and it's a different owner, then that becomes a feature that we can use as well. Um, the other thing that we um, discovered is that um, unlike most of us, people who do this for a living um, like to register large numbers of domain and batch, like hundreds. Um, and so uh, reasons for that include uh, they're cheaper if you, if you buy 100 domains at once. Um, and if you're running a business, maybe that's not what you want to do. But if you're running a scam operation, then you may need to burn through a bunch of domains quickly. And so there's some economy of scale there. We can pick up on the batch registration features as well to, to essentially figure out that something wacky is going on. OK, so that's sort of applications of machine learning to security uh, types of problems. It sort of started with spam and kind of uh, worked my way forward about 10 or 15 years to the point where we can actually use machine learning to predict attacks before they occur. And now let me sort of uh, talk about performance. OK. so. Uh, this is another area where we've spent uh, about 10 or 15 years. We started basically monitoring low level network performance uh, in various ways. We built the, you know, the first uh, ISP network measurement system that sat on a, sat on a home router. Um, this predated like what the FCC now does in this measuring broadband America program. And um, uh, some of what we did there was incorporated into the design of that. It is still used in that program. So we did a bunch of work just measuring, getting performance data out of the network. Okay. Um, next thing that you could ask beyond just raw performance is application performance. And here is essentially where uh, machine learning starts to come in. And this is more recent. This is uh, essentially last year. So beyond just knowing how fast the network can push bits, you might actually want to know how uh, your YouTube is performing. Right, what's the resolution of that video? Are there rebufferings, uh, et cetera? Uh, and for that kind of problem, uh, it becomes a machine learning problem because the traffic is encrypted. Okay, um, so um, 
I'll talk a little bit about how we did that in just a minute. Um, other things that we've that we you know that you can do with machine learning with with network data is figure out how people are using or likely to use the network as you as you change various parameters. So one study we did was to see what are users likely to do as you increase capacity. Um, okay, so let me kind of step back for a second, rewind, talk about the history of access network performance. I, I mentioned that um, you know, about, uh, about 10 years ago, we built one of the, um, uh, the first performance measurement tools that would sit on a home router, and we deployed this in about 400 homes around the world. Um, okay, so we measured throughput, latency, packet loss, all the obvious stuff. Um, and just skipping ahead about, uh, you know, uh, many tens of, 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 of papers, uh, here are some lessons uh, that we learned from, from this fairly extensive exercise. Um, one is that speed uh, has many, many facets, okay? Um, you can talk about speedtest.net or throughput or what have you, but there's, that's actually pretty complicated. At, at conceptually, uh, it's easy to talk about how fast you might move uh, a pile of bits from point A to point B on the network, uh, but when you get into um, claims of speed, performance, advertising, regulation, et cetera, all the details matter, like how many connections are you using and where are you measuring that to and what is it, you know, where, this, where are the performance bottlenecks? Are they in the home, the client, the server, the interconnect, et cetera? Um, so depending on the technique that you use to measure, you may get wildly different results. And I think this certainly comes to the classical uh, data science, machine learning notions of data quality. Um, uh, and then I, I won't go through all these here, but like I think one thing that I'll get into in the subsequent slides is that speed is something that everybody kind of understands. It's like the zero to 60 uh, metric for your car or, you know, what's the top speed? That's something that's easy to understand, even if it's hard to measure. Um, often has nothing to do with how well your applications perform. And that's where uh, a lot of more complex inference and machine learning uh, comes in. All these problems are getting pretty, you know, even harder, uh, particularly with encryption. Uh, as I mentioned, that creates some interesting inference problems. So what we've done over the past uh, uh, three or four years is to build a tool, we call it Net Microscope. Um, the idea here uh, essentially is to estimate application performance using mostly passive measurements without breaking encryption. Okay, so um, actually have this setup running on my um, home network right now. I'll just briefly um, sh show that to you. Um, but essentially what, um, you know, what the deployment looks like uh, is uh, you've, you you're maybe have a home router. Uh, sometimes people have a Wi-Fi router. So uh, current setup, the way that this basically needs to work is like, this connects to your, you know, this is your modem router. Sometimes it, it has Wi-Fi. We basically turn that off. So it's just a router. Uh, then we drop in a switch, uh, like a gigabit switch right here. You can get these for like 50 bucks on, on Amazon. Uh, and, and then from there, uh, we, um, uh, you know, we configure a span port there, a, a, a port mirroring. Uh, so that we can drop off uh, uh, a port here from which we can monitor all traffic that's like coming from your home Wi-Fi network. So here, this, this access point gets set into bridge mode so that we can see everything at this rectangular box in the middle. Okay, so um, I have this running uh, here. Um, this is based, as it's implemented in Go, it's based on uh, libpcap. Um, let me just sort of, uh, basically looks like this. Um, oops. Okay, so there's not too much interesting going on in my network right now, but um, hold on, stop oh, sharing. Nick, we're, we're still seeing your slide, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm trying to basically switch that. Let's do it like this. Uh, so it basically looks like this, okay. Um, Every five or 10 seconds, you basically get a record that looks something like that. 
Um, I don't know if I can like trigger a video. Let's just try it quickly. Um, uh, oops, that's not, okay, zoom. Okay, there we go. So uh, I'm just gonna fire up a, yeah. So there I just basically started YouTube and you can see here that the, that the system has recognized, uh, I haven't started playing anything. This could get loud. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can, uh, okay, let me just, okay, let's turn off the sound. So here I've started a video. You can't see it because, you know, I'd have to do a lot of Zoom magic. But essentially, like, what we have is something that monitors DNS traffic and then says, aha, that's a YouTube video. Uh, and then essentially starts uh, capturing statistics about that video service in real time. Uh, from which we can then subsequently determine what the performance of, uh, of that video is. And by performance, performance, of course, stop sharing. Let me just go back to my slides. Performance, of course, means uh, many different things uh, to many people. <laughs> but in terms, uh, okay, so here's what's going on. Hold on, let me shut down YouTube uh, so I can be nice to zoom here. Okay. Um, Okay, so what's going on here is, uh, you know, essentially we're using domain name system hooks to recognize like that, is, that some kind of video stream has started. There's actually machine learning going on there to detect uh, the session, okay? And um, <clears throat> once the session has started, we can gather, you know, key statistics about uh, the session itself. That does not still tell us. So there's machine learning there just to detect that like, ah, it's a video session, um, as opposed to just browsing YouTube. Um, that still doesn't tell us like anything about the, the quality of the application. So there's more machine learning uh, that essentially um, gets applied to determine these quality metrics. Okay, so how long does the video take to start playing? What's its resolution? Um, does the video bitrate change during playback? Um, and so forth. Okay, so here's a problem where we used a bunch, I mean, we basically engineered a bunch of lightweight features that we could take from, uh, you know, from that net microscope tool. Um, so as opposed to just gathering tons and tons of data, right, we basically uh, compress that down into a parsimonious representation that has only these types of features. You can see them here, hopefully. Uh, but in case the font's a little small, let me just kind of read off a few, right? So down, upstream and downstream throughput, like how much bytes are being passed um, in a given time window. Um, changes in that, the number of packets, the number of bytes, interarrival times between packets. Um, segment sizes, so videos are chunked into segments. Um, you can look at like how big they are and how they're spaced out. And all these things turn out to be useful features that ultimately we train um, in four different models, one for each of those QOE metrics. Um, good. So, um, let me just go back to this picture. Okay. So a little bit hard to see here, but essentially what, um, what we've done as part of this project is to try to, uh, build models that allow internet service providers to better understand, you know, what resolution is the video playing at? Like, is it at 240 or 1080? Um, well, you might think like, that's easy because, uh, you know, 1080 is bigger than 240. Well, not quite because there's variable bitrate encoding and, you know, watching a soccer match is, you know, going to take a lot more bits than watching a chess match. Let's put it that way. Okay. So turns out that there's some really interesting inference problems there as well. Um, okay. So, so that's kind of where we are. Um, I would say we're doing pretty well at closing this loop. Okay. Um, I've, I've shown some examples of how you can do monitoring and build models for security performance configuration. And then I really haven't closed the loop as far as, you know, automated actions, but um, to be continued on that. Um, but for the, for the, um, for the remainder of the, of the talk, um, and I'll just talk for maybe five more minutes. Um, I would like to sort of uh, pivot a little bit because one of the things, if you go back here, oops, if you go back here, um, kind of took a lot of work to pull these features out, 
Okay, and for the spam and uh, DNS, uh, sorry, the attack problems also kind of took, took a lot of work to figure out like, oh, n-grams or date time since registration or what have you. Um, but certainly for the performance stuff here, uh, you know, lots of work went into essentially engineering everything you see here on this slide. Okay, so stepping back, and this is kind of like brand new stuff, like two weeks old. Um, we've been working on it for uh, more than a year, but we, we just released this open source. And I'll, I'll give you a quick demo of this as well. Um, but the, I, the idea here uh, is um, let's just forget about that whole feature engineering step. Like deep learning is getting better and better at automatically learning representations that work well for modeling. So let's just uh, dispense with the whole feature engineering step. And could we basically just take network traffic and represent it in, in some kind of like standard fingerprint? Like let's just take a pack. What do we just take packets and, and standardize the representation? And so that's Nprint. It's an open source tool. Uh, basically is built on top of BPF packet filters. So like if you can, uh, you know, if you can run a packet capture somewhere, you can take an Nprint. Um, I'll do one uh, for you just now. Um, uh, and then it's, it's all well documented here. Um, but uh, so here's, here's sort of the general idea is that like, there are so many challenges and choices in, in data representation. And what if we could just sort of uh, uh, simplify that and let the models kind of figure out what the best data representation is. Okay, so we've started with basically packets and non-temporal models. And we've, we've, we've used this in both deep learning models as well as random, you know, things like random forest. Turns out to work pretty well for, for both. Um, we are increasingly interested in how you represent temporal relationships. But here's essentially how this, uh, how this goes, right? So you have packets. We transform them into essentially what's a normalized representation. Okay. Uh, we may compress that, like, so there are parts of a packet that never change. And so it's, you know, it can be safe to remove those. Uh, ahead of time, or the model will also just discover that. Um, but there, there are certainly lots of reasons why you may want to compress that before throwing it at the model. Uh, then you basically train the model and then there's output. Um, <clears throat> here's kind of what the end print looks like. Um, I should update this at some point. We were calling it a super header. Uh, the reason is that we need the thing to be aligned, uh, right? Because different packets have different lengths, right? And, there are options and other things. And so uh, if we're just gonna take the packet and, and create a fingerprint of bits, well then we don't want like a TCP flag to be moving around based on whether there are options, right? We want everything always to be in the same place, right? So we go from one packet to the next, the bits at you know, location 10 mean the same thing as the you know, bits in location 10 at the next packet. And that should be true regardless of whether it's a TCP packet or a UDP packet or, or any type of packet. Okay, so, uh, so we generate that representation. We have applied this to um, a bunch of different problems. I think I'll skip the evaluation just, and just so that I can show you the demo. Um, but we basically identified devices, so like attached devices on the network. We've done a huge amount of work like identifying just like consumer IoT devices. Um, if you're familiar with a tool called Nmap, um, the, the long story short, I, I won't, I'll spare you all the evaluation results, but the long story short is we just completely crushed the accuracy of that tool. Um, and we basically did it with a model that we trained in a matter of hours, uh, based, you know, comparison to Nmap's 25 years of manual feature engineering. Uh, there's another tool that will do this for operating systems called POF. Uh, we also do way better than POF in terms of uh, grand, both accuracy and granularity. So we get much higher granularity um, on operating system uh, types and versions than POF. Uh, and more recently, we've been delving into things like applications because with something like the net microscope tool that I showed you, we're using DNS to identify, let's say, a YouTube video, right? And uh, that's kind of problematic as DNS itself is, is moving towards encryption. I, I mean, for the world, DNS encryption is a good thing for privacy, but for network operations, it's a problem because uh, people still use DNS for application identification and so forth. Um, 
let me see. Uh, I'm going to skip the evaluation so that I can um, kind of show you the tool. But let me sort of talk about where we're going next before I do that. Um, one is exploring more general models, including temporal models. Um, another is sort of exploring the adversarial nature of, of uh, both its fingerprinting uh, applications, as well as many of the things that I talked about. Um, uh, and, and then the other is sort of like figuring out whether we can use those things to, uh, to create various kinds of communication channels. Okay, so in conclusion, I think basically talked about three different types of network management tasks that are becoming increasingly amenable to machine learning. Um, also, sort of looking ahead, I talked about data representation, and I want to close with just uh, you know some examples of that. So let me um, let me figure out here how I'm going to do that. Um, I'm going to try to share my terminal again. Uh, Okay, that's good. Um, so let me do this new share. Let me go here. Portion screen, that's good. So that was our net microscope. Now here's endprint. Let me do that here. Okay, it's probably a little small, but. Um, let me let me start. So endprint basically runs. It's very very similar to like a TCP dump uh, or a Wireshark if you're familiar with those those tools. So, um, I think it's yeah. So you can specify. I'll, I'll run it in just a sec. But you can specify. Um, you know, I want the bits corresponding to the IPv4 header or the you know the, the v6 header. Um, uh, you can spit it out as a CSV. You can actually spit it out as a PCAP. So you could generate a packet capture from an endprint or vice versa. Um, you can run it from the command line. You can also read in a packet an existing packet capture and generate this. So let's just look at what it looks like if I were just to do uh, IPv4. So you can see essentially what this looks like. Um, the uh, column labels went by very quickly there, but essentially what, what we, I'm going to stop it. So every row essentially is a packet, and then you get an IP address. And then uh, here is basically your packet. Uh, zeros and ones, and then negative ones are basically like just padding for alignment. Okay. Um, so uh, this thing is the same length, uh, regardless of you know options, regardless of anything. So um, this is cool, OK, because for the last 15 years, we've been relying on domain knowledge. Um, to do machine learning on network traffic. And I'm here to tell you now that you don't have to be a network expert to basically do that anymore because now we've got a packet that's basically like a picture, um, right? It's a bitmap. All you gotta do is throw it at, um, uh, th throw it at, let me get this in, throw it at a um, machine learning algorithm and you're good to go. So let me um, do that. Uh, let me see if I can just resize that. It's easier than, than resharing the window. Um, by the way, if you want to try this out, it's all online. Okay, just go to our GitHub page. Uh, here's endprint. Um, you can download it here. The example I'm about to run is in the example directory. Okay, so uh, I'll just put this in the chat uh, so that everybody has it. Let me find the chat. I'm almost done. I see that it's 11:58. Okay, so here's basically what that looks like. Um, I'm going to try to switch tabs. There we go. Okay, so um, you can take in a PCAP. Uh, uh, well, so here basically uh, um, we've written this out as um, CSVs, like just like the ones that you were seeing. Okay. Um, here are the columns. This is basically looking at TCP headers. Okay, so you can see it's fairly big. <laughs> um, all this basically does is take the endprint, makes makes it essentially, uh, you know, attaches labels to each packet. So since we have port 80, which is unencrypted HTTP, and then port 443, which is encrypted HTTP, 
we basically take each of those and attach a label to it. And then uh, this, if you've used scikit-learn on like anything, this should be very familiar. Um, I don't have time to basically um, explain the code, but if you've seen this, this should look extremely familiar, right? So I've basically taken those prints, I've put them into uh, uh, samples, targets, right? Our features and targets, split them, I've created a random forest classifier, I train the model, I predict, and then I see how well we do. Um, so I can just basically run that and then let's, let's take questions. But you'll see um, one of the things that I think we're very excited about here is uh, that it's fast. Um, because you don't have to basically do a lot of, um, you know, let me restart and clear. Okay, that's fine. Um, so you'll be able to see that this runs just uh, very, very fast. Um, okay. Uh, one of the, so there, it's basically done. So you can try this. It's basically in the public GitHub. Um, so uh, that, I conclude now, <laughs> which is good since it's 12. Um, I see that there's a bunch of questions in the chat. Let me just quickly uh, quickly hammer those. Uh, oops, let's just see. Um, so I see a couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, many features that are correlated. How do you go about feature engineering in the first place? It is, uh, that is an extremely good question. Um, I see that was asked like 15 minutes ago and hopefully some of the, um, like last 15 minutes of discussion has uh, indicated like, this is hard. You have to actually be like a domain expert to figure out which features might make sense. And that's like 90% of the work is feature engineering and representation. And part of the goal of NPrint is to basically remove that uh, somewhat cumbersome painstaking task. Um, right, how do you build a model to predict the outcomes of the what if tweaks? That's a great question. Um, Essentially, you need a lot of data. <laughs> That's the short answer of it. Because if you if the scenario is not in your data set, right, or if some combination of features is not in the data set to represent that that uh, target prediction, then you may have a tough time. Um, uh, that's the short answer. Um, uh, and then um, some people find traditional model-based methods uh, to work better. Um, that is true for uh, certain types of problems. So if you look at like, say, predicting transport performance, like I wanna predict TCP throughput. Okay, there's very good models to, pr to predict the throughput of like a TCP connection. Right? In fact, there's closed form equations to say like, if I know the packet loss of a, of a, of a path and the latency, uh, then I can predict how a TCP connection is gonna perform on that particular link. Putting aside that measuring packet loss can sometimes be difficult. Um, the issue is when you get to more complex systems. Like if you get to like a web search service or a video service or what have you, then it can be extremely difficult to model the service and the, and the relationships between the different components of the service. Um, and then it can also be extremely difficult to generalize. So that video uh, inference tool that I showed, uh, that works on six different video services. Um, they're all different, right? Hulu works a little different than YouTube uh, and so on and so forth. But actually you can, you can train general models that don't depend on the ability, ability to model any given service. So, that the, so there are some advantages to that. Um, it is true though that if your system is simple and can be modeled using a closed form equation, uh, then that, that can certainly be a better approach. Uh, increasingly, a lot of network systems are not amenable to closed form uh, modeling though. Um, great. Um, do you need admin privilege to run NPrint? No, you don't. You can run it on, a, on an existing packet capture if you want to, but it, it assumes kind of the same privilege level of, of like uh, Wireshark, right? Or uh, TCP dump, or if you will, or T-Shark, if you will. So if you have a packet capture and you want to basically feed, feed it to NPrint, then you don't need any privileges. Of course, if you need to capture off of a network interface, it requires the same kind of permissions that any kind of packet capture tool would require. Um, so, um, if you want to run it on your laptop, for example, as, as I actually thought I was running on a server, but like if you've got root on your laptop, right, and you want to capture traffic off of your network interface, you can, you can do that. Um, uh, quite recently, I think we just added, so, so I think now it compiles nicely on both Mac OS and Linux. So, um, cool. Great questions. Sorry, I kept folks a couple minutes over.
Um, All right. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. That was a very, very interesting talk. I, among many of the things you said, I didn't realize that all that goes behind the, the span detection. That was, uh, that was really interesting to, to hear about. There is. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And there's one more question I see. Yes. This is actually really, um, really good question from uh, Feng Shui, which um, uh, is like, is there a potential cross between like the feature engineering and the automated? There totally is. So one thing that I skipped over that's in the paper is you can, you can basically feed the bitmap in, right? The endprint and then do feature importance on the bitmap to dis to basically go back and discover which, which parts of the packet header were most useful. And um, we did that and then we kind of compared to like, hey, what are the rules Nmap is using? And you can learn a lot from that. I, I skipped over that in this talk because this was a little bit more broad, but um, yeah, that's a really, really good question. Uh, very good insight there. Okay. And I think with that, we'll uh, thank Nick again. You can maybe see me clapping. Hopefully everyone else is too. And uh, yeah, this was terrific. So stay tuned for our September talk. Um, we'll hopefully be sending that information about that soon. And thanks to Jonathan and David and Rinku and Rob for their help and putting this together. And thank you again, Nick. We appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for the opportunity. And I'm going to end the meeting now. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.